And if you anybody visits me this summer at the gallery, if you catch the exact right day, you might see Ari there as well. So uh, that gives you an extra chance, but I'm not gonna tell you what day or time or anything. Um, so uh, it's lovely to see so many of you here and I'm gonna jump right in. This is a new book called Sleeping As Fast As I Can. It's probably one of the few audiences I'm reading to where I do not need to say that uh, the famous Yiddish proverb, sleep fast that we need the pillows. Uh, my guess is that many of you have heard that or said it uh, yourself over time. Uh, and, uh, and this book has, is probably my most Jewish book, if I can say that. Uh, there's uh, a section that talks about uh, Jewish history and relates it to what we're going through today, which uh, I think is not the best of times, certainly. Uh, I did not expect to see in my lifetime the uptick in anti-Semitism that I thought was behind us. Uh, and uh, it also, for myself, was not the best of times because uh, my mother, uh, I watched my mother decline with dementia and uh, eventually pass away. Uh, so, uh, you know, in some ways, the book is darker than my previous collections. In other ways, uh, I'm still Jewish and we leaven the darkness with humor. Uh, that's how we get through things. That's how we have done in time. Uh, I'm gonna start with a poem uh, that's very dear to me. I dedicate pretty much all my readings to my father uh, who um, was a victim of gun violence. Uh, I have spent the last 40 something years fighting for gun safety in this country. It is alas a battle I am losing, uh, but we also don't have much choice but to keep fighting. Uh, this is called Neighborhood Villanelle. And for those non-poets listening in, I hope there are some non -poets. It's always fun to read to uh, an audience if there are some non-poets uh, in. But a villanelle is a form, this book is, in a, is most of the poems are in uh, traditional forms. Uh, a villanelle is, you will kind of get the sense, uh, stanzas of three lines, the last line in each stanza repeats uh, in a further stanza. Most people are probably familiar with Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, which is uh, a very well-known villanelle. So let's start. This is called Neighborhood Villanelle. In this neighborhood, you'd better learn to fight, my father says. Real schoolings from hard knocks. Books won't save your life. He knows I'd rather write and read. I don't talk back. His love is no birthright. Instead, I bluff, act tough. He teaches me to box. In this neighborhood, you'd better learn to fight, he says, or you'll be prey. Better tough Israelite than studious black hat, defenseless orthodox. Books won't save your life. I know you'd rather write. Next day was Hanukkah, the festival of lights. Hey, Jew boy, some kids jeered as if I wore earlocks. I was no Maccabee, bluff called, I could not fight. I came too battered, bruised, but had no appetite for bloodshed or revenge. Instead, I walked for blocks, prayed books would save my life. I swore someday I'd write these lines, and now I have. We never kissed goodnight, yet every poem I wrote, he saved. The paradox, a bullet stopped his life. Lead plug, he could not fight. I escape the neighborhood with every word I write. So um, I am going to uh, read another poem similarly on that subject. Uh, I won't beat it to death in this reading, I promise you. 
this is called Angels with Guns Guarding the Gates of Heaven. And it begins with an epigraph that says, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. National Rifle Association CEO, Wayne LaPierre. The angel staying the dagger raised arm of Abraham was one of the good guys. But studying again Isaac's binding, painted after Rembrandt, age 29, suffered his firstborn son's death, I find no weapon hidden beneath the wings of God's blue cloaked go between. And what to make of Jacob wrestling hand to hand combat with his better nature? Faith was all they had in common. Even Reuben's Lucifer-led rebels in their fallen orgy of luscious flesh had only their foolish Flemish selves to censure. So when the president's election committee dubbed as angels, those who had lost loved ones to violence by illegal South American refugees, I wondered which side of the border wall between heaven and hell was left to climb. I was in La Paz, Bolivia, when I came upon the master of Calamarca's Archangel Asiel with rifle, which I learned from the Department of Tourism spawned the convention of gun-toting deities throughout the Andes, Christ's army protecting the faithful. The missionary enforced Catholicism banned the practice of pre-Hispanic religions and the indigenous Inca thought Spanish firepower supernatural. My grandmother didn't live to see her youngest son, my father, murdered in a Brooklyn gutter by a fifth generation drug addicted unemployed house painter whose ancestors were dragged here like devils in chains. If there were armed guards inside the temple, the president said after his white nationalist supporter slaughtered 11 in Pittsburgh, they would have been able to stop him. Today, I enter the unlocked door of my Amherst synagogue, once the church where Emily Dickinson also attempted to pray. The light pours through the sanctuary's stained glass windows and squinting, I see shadows positing a loaded gun in the poet's hand. We are all Father Abraham and also Isaac, the son, she explains. And I confess how once I too believed that a guardian angel walked before each of us unarmed and chanting, make way for the image of the Lord. So um, I actually, my synagogue is Emily Dickinson's old temple. Uh, my temple is Emily Dickinson's old church, I should say. And um, we have beautiful stained glass windows, which were all donated by the Dickinson family. Uh, tonight, right after this reading, uh, we are celebrating the Jewish community of Amherst's 50th anniversary with a huge gala. and. Uh, it makes me kind of a, a bit shocked to realize that I have been there uh, for 48 of those 50 years and uh, time, time sure flies. When I first moved here, uh, we basically met in somebody's house. We shared one rabbi with Smith College and Amherst College and the University of Massachusetts. Uh, now we have multiple synagogues and many families involved. So this next poem is the longest poem I'm gonna read tonight. I figure I will do it early while you still have some energy. And it is a sestina. Again, for those who don't know, a sestina has a very formal uh, rhyme scheme. It consists of six stanzas of six lines each, 
the last word of each line repeats itself in each stanza in a prescribed order. And then there are three lines in the end where all six N words repeat. And I should mention as well that uh, because it's usually a question I get after every reading, yes, everything mentioned in this poem did happen and is true. Vermin. It was essential, Einstein stated, that he bring his violin to Bertha Fanta's salon on Prague's Old Town Square. It is 1912, four years until relativity, and six before the first wave of the Spanish flu will kill among the 500 million infected, the painter Egon Schiele already despondent over the death three days earlier of his lover, Edith, and their unborn child. Painting his pregnant lover the day before her death, he could already hear the viola and mournful bassoon of Mozart's Requiem Mass. Ready now to sketch himself dying, he gazes into the small square of his shaving mirror and recalls how he first entered the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts at age 16, even before his initial shave. No younger student accepted before or since. He died never to know he'd won that spot over the 17-year-old Adolf Hitler, who'd later loathe degenerate art and physicist Jews, moving to Berlin to pursue politics, aborting both brush and pen. The square root of time displacing millennia of atoms is music already usurping Einstein's brain. As nodding to Max Brode, he readies his violin under his chin. The pianist, who already has four of his 83 books penned to literary acclaim, looks squarely into the eyes of his closest friend, Franz Kafka. Brode loves his quiet companion's unpublished scribblings, which violate all of fiction's conventions. He had offered Franz absinthe for courage before inviting him to Berthe's if he'd recite the story about a transformation into vermin. Yet, rising to read to his fellow Jews, even Kafka cannot conceive of violence so extreme that each present will be dubbed a cockroach. For now, though, let's leave these imaginative culture lovers in paradise and in a Kafka esque absurdity of E equals MC squared, time travel to British Columbia, we will reappear squarely inside a brothel owned by Bavarian born Friedrich Trump. Theoretically viable, we can locate the villain who, full of self-love, emigrated at 16 to avoid the military draft. He has already plan to move to Queens, where he'll die five months before Sheila of the same deadly flu. His atoms still infecting us via his grandson's love of Hitlerian speech. Even Kafka cannot square anti-alien taunts with Melania's Einstein visa violation. I pray thee, Lord, a fevered Mozart pleads. Forgive me, forget me, I am done for. So, um, the Jews historically were often blamed for various plagues. Uh, they were blamed for the Black Plague, they were blamed for the 1912 Plague, um, and also historically, um, 
they suffered less often than their neighbors, which was one of the reasons, not that you needed any reasons to blame them. Uh, the, uh, and of course, there are reasons for that. Uh, probably the most prominent one is that, unlike the rest of the population, the Jews cleaned their home once a year on Passover. Uh, and uh, also, they tended to be in small ghettos where they did not interact with the general public. Uh, so they were blamed, of course, when plague came along. This, po this poem is called Poisoning the Well, and it is in rhyme couplets. It was 1348 when the Tulan Jews were first accused of poisoning wells, my grandfather says. I've refused at eight to wash my hands before dinner. And so a story about purity, the bubonic plague, and God's glory is proper punishment. Though then as now, persecution and rotting cadavers seem to me meager confirmation of heavenly endorsement. When brutalized, some reach toward religion. Others might apostatize or research their inner demons. My grandfather abandoned all trivial delights for Talmudic law, bathing corpses before burial, purging the house of chametz, and cashering the oven each Pesach, while I, feather in hand, dusted for leaven. The city's Jews, segregated in a walled off ghetto, escaped pestilence, only to face forced repentance or scapegoated to be staked and burned. I think of those pious today on hearing the president cite a Chinese virus to stoke fear while trumpeting ignorance. The mobs attacked to absolve debts, embezzle land, or appease gods. What fears, I wonder, will my grandchildren understand me to be quelling when I demand they wash their hands? Uh, so uh, one more poem, and then we'll move on to, uh, I was about to say happier matters, but we'll move on to other matters, I'll say. Um, this poem is a sonnet. It is called Bless You, and it starts with an epigraph. Since sneezing was the first sign of falling ill with the plague, Pope Gregory ordered prayer for divine intercession. And that, in fact, is the reason uh, that uh, we bless people when they sneeze uh, to this day. Uh, it started during the Black Plague. Bless you. Gesundheit, great Anne Frieda calls out. Each sneeze, another occasion for my soul to abandon my body. I hurry my index finger under my nose horizontally, locking both nostrils as tutored, so evil can seize an inhale to fill the void. Denying the devil his due, Frieda dubs it, she who at 60 to my six reflexively worries her brow, reaches towards a box of Kleenex and spits over her shoulder. I mimic patoo, patoo, patoo. Tonight, eight years older than she was at her death and dining curbside to curtail the coronavirus, I hear two tables over, ah, uh, chew. And for the first time in years, measure the distance between superstition and truth. Around me, panic, as mid forkful, everyone freezes. May God keep us upwind from all airborne diseases.
So I'm going to read a poem that I only read uh, to Jewish audiences. And I already uh, checked with Ari ahead of time. Uh, there is, um, in the end, a swear word uh, that is used, I hope, in a comic manner. This is, this is called Lucky Jew Guzzle. And that, the guzzle is a form of uh, stanzas of two lines where the second line of each uh, stanza has the same word. And in the very last stanza, the poet addresses themselves and ends up again with that same ending word. Lucky Jew Guzzle. And it starts again with an epigraph from the Times of Israel. Lucky Jew figurines are more popular and populous than actual Jews in Poland. I think uh, for those of you who have visited Krakow, um, it's a very interesting uh, situation where uh, right now they are or have been for years trying to celebrate uh, the Jewish heritage, but there are very few Jews. Lucky Jew guzzle. In my kiosk in Krakow, you can buy a lucky Jew. Good fortune vows to follow you who own this tchotchke Jew. Placed near the entry door, he's sure to keep your coin secure. This knickknack makes you well-to-do, just like a wealthy Jew. Rub his kipper, stroke his beard, tug his curly sidelocks. Your stocks will increase faster than a billion Zlati Jews. Long life and prosperity are how Jews bless their brethren. They dress in black, stay in the pink, think like a healthy Jew. Jewish prophets have a nose for profit and success. Contrast your prospects with my needing rhinoplasty Jews. A rabbit foot or horseshoe charm won't cause you any harm. But each one lacks the air of God. So try my tax-free Jews. Jews are resourceful, clever, kindly. That is why good news pursues even the socialist or bourgeois Bernie Jews. I beg you, Richard, don't pass by this poor unlucky Jew. Put up your nose and mock me then, rich fucking lucky Jew. All right, so where did that come from? All right, uh, so um, it's amazing to see all these um, polls selling uh, very, what are the worst stereotypical Jews to other polls. Um, so that they get luck, as though Jews have been lucky in Poland, boggles the mind. Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems about my mom. I can only see a few of you, uh, but looking at the few of you I see, uh, I think age-wise, you probably all remember Neil Diamond's song, Sweet Caroline. Um, if I could, uh, if I was technically proficient, I would have the music as a backdrop to this poem. Um, it's, I was very close to my mother, uh, who, um, had a wonderful mind, uh, even if she had a very difficult life, uh, and was never able to really develop her, um, intellectual capacities. Uh, and her name happened to be Caroline. And it struck me, you know, when she was uh, towards the end of her Alzheimer's, when she was in the memory care unit uh, and knew me, but didn't really know who I was. Uh, yet when I would go, she seemed happier than she ever had been in her life. 
uh, which is kind of an odd thing. I was, you know, uh, so sorry to see her suffering with this disease, um, but she was a child again for the first time that I'd seen in years, laughing and dancing. Um, and, uh, and it makes me wonder how we love people who are no longer the people we love. You know, where's the core of us? How do we, uh, you know, when those uh, who we loved change and are no longer recognizable, um, the love remains. So for me, it's an interesting uh, dilemma. Anyways, this is called Sweet Caroline. It is also in rhyme couplets. From this distance, you could be shooing flies. But as I exit independent living to enter the memory care unit, I can see performing his Neil Diamond dip, shake, swivel, the resident accordionist. According to Wiesenthal, evil flourishes when the good do nothing. And the evidence is everywhere. Yet from here, Watching you dance to the wheeze and bellow, the choir of cafeteria aides praising your name with every chorus. I think of the arrays of the brain, our synapses endlessly reinventing us. Dementia is lessened by music therapy, the director mentions, which has the potential to ameliorate your mother's depression. And so, I watch you sway and clap. Your expression, unrecognizable, is, dare I say the word, sweet. Oh, Caroline, may you, who prize the vinegar above honey, resigned to life's bitter truths, a husband's murder, an indifferent God, now finally sing good times never seen so good. Uh, I have a whole series in this book that chronicles my mother's life over the last year. Uh, it was difficult to write, but also um, necessary for me. And uh, this poem is called Unveiling. Another sonnet. At the university in Tel Aviv, the scientists have printed a miniature human heart, 3D, rabbit-sized, but replete, the researcher used her own cells, with blood vessels, mitral valves, ventricles, kava. When my mother's muscle stopped beating, Moments after I gave the surgical center my written non-intervention permission, I became aware for the first time of the worn of the body, its escape routes and artificial enclosures. No soul, but soil, my mother taught, and it stuck. After life of neither God nor prayer, but pebble, mud, dirt. And yet, one year to the day, my sister and I gather graveside to recite transliterated the mourner's Kaddish after divesting the monument of its covering cloth. Ritual complete, we fold into vehicles, two emergency medical cooler torsos, transporting home our holy yet temporary hearts. So um, uh, my holy trinity in life, uh, if you were to go by my books of poems, seems to be uh, Moses, Rembrandt, and Kafka. Um, they seem to show up in all my poems, even when I'm not expecting them. Uh, this is a poem called Reading Kafka to My Daughter. And... Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's kind of odd. I am known primarily these days 
as an author of children's books. Uh, that is, you know, for those who do know my name, that's what's going to first be conjured is children's books. Um, yet I was never read to as a child that I can remember. Um, and when my children were young, I really didn't read to them either. Uh, I just was not, it was not in my frame of reference uh, that we should read to children every night. Uh, now, of course, I'm an acolyte and I spend most of my life uh, traveling, uh, getting people to read with their children. Uh, but uh, at the time, you know, uh, I didn't understand the notion of children's books. So if I had to read to my children, I would read out loud what I happened to be reading. Uh, so this is called reading Kafka to my daughter. It was a second grade sleepover in the open space recently renovated above our garage. And seven, seven-year-old girls dizzying their bodies in the way a story consumes the one spinning it. A chrysalis of choice and misdirection until you emerge unrecognizable even to yourself. It happened that I was in the basement reading The Metamorphosis when my wife got the call from her mother and left me alone. Well, not alone, one of eight in the house before bedtime. So it came to pass that I, rolling out the plastic mat with the wide colored circles, stood among shrieks and giggles as the numerous, if pitifully thin limbs, transmuted left foot red, right hand green, into a single multi-headed overtired insect. But that, the insistent shape shifting of our forms and minds is not what I wanted to say. Nor is this poem about the wife, about the calls my wife failed it all of the following week about the inappropriateness of reading Kafka. How could he to prepubescence? No, I share this only to better remember the morning after the nightmare, when I went to wake them, their tangled intentions and odd dreams twisted protectively around each other. Then suddenly, like a field of sunflowers, each tilted her face toward the skylight, petals extended upwards as if stretching to touch daybreak's bright, yellow sphere. All right, I'm gonna skip a few. Um, I've already done enough damage. I'm gonna skip a few Holocaust poems. <laughs> um, uh, so we have some time to talk. Um, I also have in this book, um, it's not this time, but there's a section where I reinterpret the Haggadah um, and rewrite the prayers for myself. I always had trouble with a lot of the various prayers uh, that we uh, read uh, during that holiday. Uh, maybe I will read one. This is a, actually a long poem called Turtle of Slow Devotion, 11 Prayers for Passover. But I think I'm going to read a couple of uh, short excerpts. This is called, this section is called Prayer Before the Breaking of the Matzah. And if we must be broken, let us be broken like the afikomen, that hidden shard of matzah cherished above the hole. Let us be wrapped in the soft linen napkin of the Lord's silence, like pilgrims kneeling on smooth stones in a Jerusalem gutter, oblivious to the clatter of the market. Let our children, searching beneath cushions, call out to claim lost quarters. Let them ransom us back to the table. And maybe one other very short section. Prayer before the parting of the sea. So I always wonder, as I do oftentimes, uh, had I been a slave in Egypt, 
and following Moses uh, to the edge of the sea uh, that had not yet parted, uh, whether I would have had the courage to follow him in, which would have looked to me like uh, a lemming jumping off a cliff. Um, and, uh, and yet there are things we take on faith, uh, but I try to think of those who uh, came to that edge and could not take that fateful step. Uh, I think I would have been among them. Prayer before the parting of the sea. Let us praise those abandoned on the shore, unsure of the trick of their eyes, but knowing in their hearts that the waters will refuse to part. They are standing there still, calculating tides and measuring mudflats, their flow charts and bridges deserving no lesser suspension of disbelief. Maybe watch our brethren pass over dearly, their encouragements drowned in the sound of the armies descending upon us. Death's certainty, too, is a kind of miracle. And I'm going to end with a prayer, with a uh, meditation called Meditation After Casting My Sins Upon the Waters. As if God had kicked the crutch of belief out from under the limbs of the wounded. As if our souls were unwanted weekend guests in the summer beach house of the body. As if I were still the magician's prepubescent assistant waving my skinny arm and wand. I will create as I speak, the Lord once saith, in Aramaic no less, Avra Kadavra, distracting us with cape and hat and that sly cunning grin. Oh, how I envied his deep voice and gift for misdirection. And now my astonishment at this morning's small miracle when up early and stumbling at the shore, I saw as I fell face down into the shallows, my sins swimming about me like a school of minnows. No, I mean like my own fingers, all 10 of them intertwining into a gesture of prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, can you hear me okay? I don't know whether it's my computer. It's been unstable, but I've had some issues today. Do you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay. Um, so thank you for sharing um, some of the poems from the book. I will share the link for people who want to purchase it in a follow-up email, as long as as well as some other references based on the on your your readings today. Uh, we had I had some questions about like trying to understand some of the poems, taking them apart more. I don't know if we'll get there, but let me ask some general questions. First of all, just a fundamental question. Uh, well, uh, to our audience, feel free to chat questions directly, and, and we will try to get to as many as we can in the next um, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, have any of your books been banned to date in any of the uh, public schools? That's the first question. Uh, uh, mostly they're just not read, I guess. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't believe so. Um, and uh, it's funny because we sometimes talk about uh, one of my gallery artists, Raul Colon, um, who I have a show that I'm doing shortly, uh, just had uh, of, uh, of work from his books that have been banned recently. Uh, he said, of course, it was the best thing that ever happened to him because his book, which was written about 15 years ago and had been lingering forever, uh, suddenly uh, is selling tons of copies and, uh, and I'm planning a show <laughs> of the illustrations from the banned book. So he's thrilled. A lot of my friends, um, one of my closest friends uh, who, we, who I have lunch with every month is Leslie Newman, uh, who wrote uh, Heather Has Two Mommies. Uh, which is perhaps the most banned book in 
history. Um, I uh, nothing of mine has been banned that I'm aware of. Okay, well, we wish, we hope that something will get banned from this yeah, maybe poetry. Write, write to your school districts. <laughs> hey, all of you, please try to get this I book. Like this. <laughs> okay, it's just a marketing idea I came up with. Yeah, I did. there you go. So these poems are all new? I mean, are these, have are, are any of these been published before? These poems are all new. Uh, my last uh, adult collection, I think, came out in 2018. Um, and so... Uh, these poems were all written uh, during the reign of Trump, the coronavirus, my mom's dying, um, and uh, and hence, uh, I think uh, there's not as much uh, joy and humor. I hope you did find some humor in the poems uh, in some of my earlier books. Uh, I think I got it out of my system. I'm about a quarter through my next book. And so far, uh, I think it's all funny poems. So I must have, uh, I, I must need a break. Hmm. So you have, I mean, you have a running business, operating business um, with your gallery and your children's books and the artists you represent. When do you find time? When do you write your poems? Oh boy. Um, well, uh, I always say I've got a full-time job. I'm a full-time author and a full-time speaker. Um, I, I guess I'm disciplined for one thing. Uh, when I was younger and was building my business, uh, I would basically write um, at the night after the kids went to bed uh, and get up early. Uh, I can't do that anymore. I can't go without sleep as I did for a long time. Uh, so I tend, to, uh, I tend to work in the morning uh, and then uh, usually Usually in the hours, I would say, uh, you know, I get up, I read a little bit, I have breakfast, I try to, uh, I check my email, uh, I do all the things that waste time, uh, and uh, and usually somewhere around ten or ten to twelve, uh, I'll sit down and actually write, uh, and then I try to uh, get up and uh, either bike or stretch out or do qigong go to the gym and then i'll stop i'll work at the gallery in the afternoon are you are you a person who writes poetry and then it's done quickly or do you kind of go back to your poems and rework them rework them rework them uh, nothing is done nothing is done quickly uh it, you know people people seem to think i'm more prolific than i am because i've had such good fortune with my children's books and they are out there and they sell very well and uh, I speak about them a lot. Uh, but, you know, again, this volume of poems is, uh, took me six years to write, basically. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't have a lot that I don't finish. Uh, you know, I, I, it's not like I have a, a whole folder of poems that didn't work. Uh, I'm terribly, uh, if I if I working on something, I just keep going sentence by sentence, uh, but you know, poems will take me months. Hmm. Eric asked a question. So this poem, this book of poetry, as you mentioned, is, is very Jewish. So how do, how do you, what do you think a non-Jewish audience would say? I mean, one poem you read to us, you said you wouldn't read in front of a different audience about the Polish um, figurines, but what's your yeah. perspective on, on, like, have you read these to non-Jewish audience? What's happened? Oh, yeah, no, all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, there's, um, you know, the uh, lucky Jew goes, oh, I tend not to read in general, because um, I think it, uh, having the context of the book helps. Uh, I also, you know, I don't want to be making fun of stereotypes uh, to an audience where somebody might not realize that I'm making fun of the stereotypes. They probably wouldn't get that far in the book if they were anti-Semitic to begin with. But uh, I just feel more comfortable uh, reading there. Uh, I read, you know, the poem, the book has um, a, a lot of political uh, poems, uh, certainly poems about my dad's murder um, and more general poems about my mom's failing that don't really, uh, 
that Judaism doesn't necessarily enter into it, but I don't shy away from reading the Jewish poems either. I think, uh, you know, that's the particular is what, you know, I'm, I'm always moved when uh, people who aren't Jewish come up to me and tell me that my poems resonated with them, uh, that they had similar, you know, immigrant in their family experience, uh, certainly, I'm sorry to say how many people come up to me and tell me that they have a family member who was also murdered. Uh, it's an epidemic and you can't go anywhere without, um, without people relating to that. So I think, you know, we're all human. We all have, uh, you know, the same experiences in general. So, you know, I love reading to Jewish audiences, uh, but I don't, uh, it's not, for me, I should I just should say quickly that um, I did not grow up, in fact, with any Jewish education of any kind. I was not bar mitzvah. Uh, I did not uh, go to temple uh, when I was married. My wife, who's Methodist, um, wanted to have both a uh, minister and a rabbi there. Her family did, um, and we ended up getting married by a justice of the peace. I was very anti-religion of all kinds. Um, my mother grew up in an Orthodox household and totally um, rejected it. Uh, so there was no pressure there. Uh, by happenstance, uh, a few years after we were married, my wife decided to convert to Judaism. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> I thought she was crazy. Uh, and one of the things that she had to do uh, was study with uh, three rabbis. Um, this is her story to tell, but in fact, he went into labor while in a mikvah. Uh, that's, uh, um, we showed up at the mikvah, three male rabbis, um, myself and the female attendant took one look at us and said, are you almost sugar? This woman's in labor. Um, but, uh, um, but I started I, I went to temple really for the first time with my wife after her conversion. Uh, and uh, there, she was in a class of two. Uh, some of your audience might know uh, Julius Lester, uh, who was a well-known black militant figure who uh, later converted to Judaism along with my wife. Um, when I went to temple the first time, we showed up early, my wife and Julius, who I knew only as a sense of black militant who used to be part of SNCC and was kicked off New York City radio for anti-Semitic comments um, and lost that gig and later uh, started studying Judaism. It's you never know what paths your lives are gonna take. Uh, wrote a book that to my mind is still one of the very best uh, that I have ever read on identity called Love Song, Becoming a Jew. I recommend it to everyone. Um, I also recommend to everyone, I don't want to forget, and I don't want to go off track, uh, Roger Kamenetz, who's in the audience, whose book on Kafka, um, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, but, uh, and then later, of course, as you know, my closest friend, uh, Leonard Nimoy, better known as Spock, um, was very Jewish. Uh, so both Julius and Leonard had a big effect on me, as did my wife, and I started studying uh, Judaism. I started reading. And lo and behold, now um, mo my books tend to be used to teach the next generation of kids what it means to be a Jew. So, you know, you follow the road where it leads. Hmm. Were you always, I mean, did you start writing poetry early in life or is that, when did that develop? No, I started, um, I wasn't much of a student. Um, I wanted to, uh, I was on the road for th three years as a traveling salesman, uh, trying, making, trying to make money to go to school. I would go for a, a semester, then work for a semester. I was selling actually art reproductions. Um, and that's a long story. But, uh, you know, I started writing more because I was on the road and there were times and I was really expressing myself. I, you know, I did write a little bit earlier. Um, my mother loved crossword puzzles um, and had a love of language uh, that obviously came to me. 
uh, and uh, and I started uh, writing about you know when my kids were a little older and they would ask me questions about I think one of their bar bat mitzvah uh, uh, questions was they had to write about a family member and I realized that uh, I thought of myself as fairly well educated I knew about English history I knew about uh, Russian history, but I knew absolutely nothing about where I came from, where my relatives were. And I was a writer. And the way writers learn, or the way I learn, is by writing. So I started writing about uh, and exploring my history, uh, both in poetry and children's books. And, uh, and here we are. Miriam wants to know, you gave us the type of uh, poetic styles you were writing in um is that normal for you do you just you write in eclectic styles your preferred styles what's um, your why do you like highly ordered verse forms uh, no this this book is different i think my earlier books are much more in free verse uh tend to be a lot of longer poems i felt because because this book was so close to me writing about my mother and my father death um, when I first started writing, I found I was having a hard time containing my emotions into and making sense of them within uh, my poems. And so I just started seeing what I could express, say, within the sonnet form and found that that allowed me to emote and still know what my limits were and uh, where I was going to about. And then that led me to uh, start um, start in other, you know, other forms. My wife during the pandemic started taking her online poetry course and writing some poems. Uh, and one of her assignments was to write a sestina. So she asked me um, about sestinas and what they were, et cetera. Uh, so my answer was to write one. And then my answer was to write another. And then I fell in love and decided to uh, write other forms as well. Mm, thank you. Last few minutes, last few questions. Can you tell us a little bit about your, oh, so which, which, who, which poet do you read now? Do you have any, give us three recommendations of people we should know from your bookshelf. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, it's easy to mention because the picture's right in front of me, Roger Kamenetz, uh, who has been on your show and is a wonderful poet, um, The Missing Jew which is his life's work in many ways, uh, um, you know, pick that up. Uh, I have the first iteration of that, which I believe was in the late seventies or early eighties um, when I was looking for uh, other poets uh, who had some similar um, passions as I did. Uh, my go-to is Yehuda Amachai, the great Israeli poet uh, who, um, you know, I think I start every one of my books with an epigraph by, um, by Amachai. Uh, I carry one book in the glove compartment of my car in case I'm stuck in light, et cetera. And it's uh, uh, uh collected poems. Um, so I know uh, that I'll never be without it if I'm abandoned somewhere. Uh, and then, uh, I should, I should look to see what else, you know, I read a lot of contemporary poets and I'm sorry if you're online and I've, um, I've missed you and that's because your picture isn't on. So you're not in front of me and I don't want to start mentioning one without the other. Um, you know, I read, I read constantly, a lot of my friends are poets. Um, if I'm going back to uh, certainly, you know, certainly I read Kafka um, and, uh, you know, James Wright is a poet who was very important to me uh, when I was learning to write poetry and is still, you know, there are a number of poets I started with that I no longer read, um, but he's, he remains certainly important to me. I also have a radio show where I interview poets. Uh, please check out my website is Richard Michelson, M I C H E L S O N dot com, and there's a link to the various. Uh, poets who have appeared there, uh, and uh, many of them are work I love. 
I feel like I got you in trouble by asking you that question. So I apologize. I don't want you to like <laughs> get some calls after this. You didn't mention their name. Last question. Tell us about your Broadway show that you're writing because you do have oh, many I, talents. I, so I, I figure why not share that as well? Um, well, thank you for saying that. But Broadway is a leap and a jump. Um, we, we shall say off, off Broadway, off Broadway. Um, I have a musical theater piece about the life of Edward Monk. Uh, the artist of the screen. Um, uh, there's not a lot of Judaism in there, but there is a lot of uh, Catholicism uh, imagery in there. He wrestled with his religion um, and Protestantism and uh, all that uh, throughout his life. And it's a musical. Uh, it's uh, It should be, for those of you in New York, I believe uh, next spring, it will be opening in a full production. And then it will go to L.A. Oh, uh, so, okay. Um, if you don't catch us on the East Coast, hopefully you catch us on the West Coast. So you'll keep me informed and we'll bring okay. a group up. I'll get Howard Merowitz in a van and we'll meet Rosa Berman up in L.A. and we'll see the show. Great. And uh, please check out my kids' books if you have grandkids, kids. Um, I think, uh, you know, feel free to email me. My email is on my website. If you have a question I haven't gotten to, uh, send it along. Thank you. Any particular kids book that you recommend? What's your, what's the one if, if people don't know about okay, it? Again, that's like asking me to name uh, which poet. Yeah, but they, they can't, they can't call you up and complain. So that's good. I'll, so, yeah. I'll say, uh, you know, read, I was on your show with Fascinating, The Life of Leonard Nimoy, which talks about how Live Long and Prosper uh, was, you know, the old Jewish uh, blessing. A is for Abraham, a Jewish family alphabet is used in a lot of uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Hebrew schools, day schools, etc. Uh, across the alley, I think is uh, very near to my heart because it's my own story about a uh, Jewish neighborhood that became a, a black neighborhood. And probably my best known is um, uh, as good as anybody, Abraham, Joshua Herschel, and Martin Luther King's amazing march towards freedom. And lastly, I'll just because it won the National Jewish Book Award, The Language of Angels, a story about the reinvention of Hebrew. Nice. So you asked for one, you got. <laughs> I got I got a lot. Well, I will I will follow I'll follow this program with an email with some details. I'll put links in. Of course, I'll probably share Roger Kamenitz's uh, program that we did online as well. So you can enjoy that. It's always nice to have to get cultured here at CSP to host poets. You know, you you guys are uh, in many respects the prophets of our time. You you say things that we need to hear, whether we want to or not, um, and you bring us our Judaism back in in different ways. So, to you, Richard, and to you, Roger, and any other poets who are on today, thank you for being with us on Sunday, and good luck out there with the book. As I said, I hope you both get banned this week. I will do my <laughs> best to get you a certain in some places. I'm sure they would, and. Um, Good to see everybody. Lots coming up from CSP this week. Shavuot is coming. Get ready for the giving of the Torah. Stay up late. Um, read poetry. I read anything that is relevant to you. Just read. Take care, Richard. I look forward to seeing you uh, in your you, neck everyone. of the woods. Thank you summer. all for taking your time to tune in. It is really appreciated. Um, there's nothing better than being able to share with people uh, your work. So thank you. I mean it. Thank you so much. Talia and Katz, good to see you. Yana, Rosa, everybody, Cliff, take care. Keep safe, keep healthy, enjoy your Sunday. Bye, everybody. Bye.